So I want to thank Melanie for the wonderful introduction and this, this vast network that she's working to create seven stages of sustainability. Uh, someone asked if I was in agreement with this approach, and by all means, the approach as anything in activism has to have some type of uniform unfolding. We can get into details about how to best affect society in many different ways uh, as far as detail, transition, but what's unique about the presentation I'm going to give, which is, give, which is slightly uh, in anticipation of this, is really what comes down to the definition of sustainability itself. So we can think about the stages of, of applying sustainability and getting people active in such a way, but unless people have a very clear understanding of what it means to be sustainable, we might end up running in circles. So I hope that this presentation I'm about to give, called The Big Picture, Sourcing Human Sustainability, will give some insight into the way I and the Zeitgeist move to think about things. So, uh, by the way, there's some text issues in the format that I've noticed with the presentation as it was converted, so please, please ignore the issue if you see that. Uh, the other slides seem to be okay. So, the formal beginning. My name is Peter Joseph, and welcome to the big picture, Sourcing Human Sustainability. As some may know, I work with a global sustainability advocacy group called the Zeitgeist Movement. This organization, as the very name implies, seeks to transition away from our dominant values and practices, the current zeitgeist, which, as I'm going to argue, has proven to be increasingly detrimental to human and environmental well-being today, as they appear to be very much decoupled from governing natural physical laws. Very quickly, the zeitgeist movement considers the vast majority of problems in the world, such as poverty, the debt crisis, the unemployment epidemic, the ecological destabilization, and the like, as literally unresolvable within the current social structure in place, as they appear to be actually inherent to the system itself. Therefore, in order to overcome such issues, we need to start considering larger, more radical, if you will, changes to the very nature of the socioeconomic system itself. And the goal of our organization is to not only help arrive at what could define a truly sustainable you know, environment, a humane social system in effect, but also to find the means to transition, uh, just as Melanie has been working to, to uh, assist with as well. So, that introduction aside, I would like to start with a question. What is sustainability? Is it merely an ecological notion, such as trying to be green, as we often hear with respect to industrial methods and the like? What about the economic system? Is the very manner of conduct reinforced by our market economy actually conducive to the tenets of a truly sustainable approach? Or better yet, what about psychology? Since at the core of all social institutions are people and their motivations, what about the relevance of human psychology itself, and hence the culminated sociological condition that defines normality as we know it? Is the underlying dominant psychology in the world today actually in line overall with the true definition of sustainability itself? Or are we walking as a whole, as a society, literally against the tide, if you will, unknowingly, ignorantly, perpetuating outdated and inapplicable beliefs and methods that are further compounding the growing societal crises we are experiencing today? If you think about it, the term sustainable essentially implies the maintaining of balance within a governing system. On the ecological level, a simple example is the concept of dynamic equilibrium, if you're familiar. And when it applies to, say, a natural resource harvesting like wood, obviously if we harvest trees faster than the rate of natural earthly regeneration, we have a clearly unsustainable practice. However, the consideration of sustainability gets more complicated as we extend out and the symbiotic relationship of the natural world system and its physical scientific laws come into play in a very important way. Needless to say, it's not a profound notion, but unfortunately it's not given the credence it deserves. 
building on the prior example, the, cre the clearing of forests for wood is also found to have much larger subtle effects, at least in perception, which can inhibit human sustainability over time to a very, very, very detrimental degree, such as the obvious reality that forests as a whole have a massive ecological role in and of themselves, which if disturbed can cause problems such as soil erosion, carbon dioxide imbalance, loss of life-saving biodiversity, and many other consequences to the human condition, even though on the surface, we are often not aware of such things. It has taken science to figure out these relationships. And when you extend this logical inference more so, stepping back and considering this symbiotic interrelationship of the world, you will, you will inevitably draw the conclusion that the only context we can possibly consider applying a truly sustainable practice as a species is in the context of acknowledging the total Earth system and its inherent natural physical laws. I'll state that again because it's critical. The only possible context which can embody a truly sustainable approach is the recognition and alignment with the largest system reference conceivable. Now, that might seem abstract to many, maybe even ambiguous. But once this scientific systems theory, if you will, once this approach is understood with respect to how we, the human species, are to align with pre-existing natural laws, you will discover that the entire basis of our current global society, from the divided nation states, to the competing market economy, to the dominant religious and philosophical institutions, is actually walking against the natural order of reality when it comes to human survival, public health, sustainability, prosperity, and even against our evolutionary fitness, as we are not adapting sufficiently enough, as we are being held back, in fact, by stubborn, established customs, and the world you see around you, full of imbalance, decay, disorder, and conflict, is the consequence and result. Since the beginning of recorded history, the scientific premise of reality, meaning the nature and dynamics of causality in and of itself, has been given very little respect, unfortunately. To our detriment, the major value structures and establishments in human history thus far have been oriented around largely superstitious, su sur surface intuitive, if you will, traditional views of ourselves, our environment, and the quality of our behaviors and practices. It has taken a great deal of time and suffering for the humbling foundational notion that we, humans, are governed by a larger order rule set, physical law, and rather than impose our traditional cultural values upon the world to our disadvantage in the end, we must learn to start respecting and adapting to these pre-existing rules on all levels. Nature, needless to say, really doesn't care what you or I think is good, bad, moral, ethical, or correct in our opinionated world. It has its own agenda. So, when we step back and examine the domi dominant customary practice of our global culture today, from the economic game, to politics, to industry, to philosophy, we find a detachment, a decoupling. We're out of sync from what science is telling us about proper alignment with physical governing natural laws, and hence the ultimate definitional referent of the term sustainability. So that overview noted, I'm going to now make some comparisons between our current economic tradition and what basic science has now shown us with respect to what true global economic sustainability actually requires. But let's first remind ourselves what an economy actually is. Economy in Greek means the management of a household. It means efficiency and reducing waste. The term economize. Keep that in mind as we go along. We're going to use two terms for this comparison. The first we're going to call abstractly, a natural law economy, which doesn't exist at this point, at least not in application, which would essentially be defined as the following. 
Decisions are directly based upon scientific understandings as they relate to optimized habitat management and human health. Production and distribution is regulated by the most technically efficient and sustainable approaches known. Now we're going to compare this to our current market economy as it is practiced today, defined as decisions are based on independent human actions through the vehicle of monetary exchange regulated by the pressures of supply and demand. Production and distribution is enabled by the buying and selling of labor and material provisions with the motivations of the person or group, competitive self-interest in other words, as the defining attribute of unfolding. Okay, here is a list of seven economic attributes of each economic model in contextual comparison, all of which I'm going to address one by one. You'll notice the asterisk, asterisk, excuse me, asterisks at the bottom have to do with issues that relate to informational advancements in science and technology, which is, of course, a part of a scientific-based economic system. It isn't just physical in the material sense. It also has to do with knowledge and method. This will become more clear as we move forward. Part one, excuse me, point one, actually, consumption. As noted on the, on the left of this slide, the market economy is driven by consumption. That is the fuel, if you will, that keeps people employed and maintains purchasing power. If consumption was to stop or significantly slow, all life-supporting processes enabled are stifled. The world economy today is really based on one thing, turnover through sales, period. How does that compare to the demands of the natural world, as noted on the right side of this slide? The ethic is really the opposite, preservation. The Earth is a finite, closed system for the most part, and the reduction of waste and hence true economic efficiency by that definition is demanded to be sustainable. That is, again, the true definition of an economy. Point two, obsolescence. This isn't something people talk about very often, but it's very much a part of what we're doing in the market economy. Obsolescence, as noted on the, on the left, is the market economy's way of maintaining market share through repeat purchases. There's two forms of obsolescence, intrinsic and planned. Intrinsic obsolescence has to do with the cost-cutting necessity of companies. In order to remain affordable and competitive, against other companies that are cost-cutting as well to undercut them for market share. It's called cost efficiency in traditional economics. The result, immediately inferior products the moment they are made. It is impossible to make the best of anything at the time of the knowledge that's available for us because of cost efficiency. The next one is planned obsolescence, which is much worse. During the Great Depression in the United States, the need for turnover to boost the economy brought about the idea of deliberately reducing good quality for the sake of turnover. Huge economic praise and awards were given to these people who decided, let's just reduce the quality of goods so people have to buy more of them so we can keep people employed to make bad goods again so they can stay employed. Again, <laughs> is this truly economically efficient? Obviously, that's a rhetorical question. Well, it is considered efficient in the market economy. We should point that out but it is completely inefficient with respect to natural law. And as noted on the right, natural law demands optimum design, longevity, logical enough. It's environmentally irresponsible to design goods to fail or to allow them to fail unnecessarily, yet it is a universal practice today and needed to keep our economic system in operation. Point three, property. A foundational premise of the market economy is singular ownership. It's a metaphysical notion if you think about it, because both ideas and physical goods are transient and serially developed. The result is a mass repeat duplication of items and wasting of resources and energy, not to mention time. What does nature have to say about this? Well, universal property is simply inefficient. Strategic access if you will, is more environmentally responsible as a model and more socially efficient as well. For if we consider the actual use of the good instead, 
we find a method of shared access distribution, not blind ownership, can preserve resources while also meeting the needs of more people because of the nature of a strategic access system. Uh, we have examples of this in very minimalistic forms. You can go to certain countries that have bikes on the street that you can put some change in and ride around with in return. We, of course, have Zipcar, which is a phenomenon in New York City. Uh, it's a brilliant idea. Uh, but unfortunately, it goes against the grain, even though those subtle aspects actually are in place. It's uh, an ownership society, unfortunately, and that's very detrimental in the long term. You know, I, for example, I'm a filmmaker. I have tons of film equipment. I would rather not have to house this stuff in my closets. I would prefer to rent it when I need it because I don't use it all the time. However, in a monetary society, based on ownership, not access, it's literally unaffordable for me to do that. It costs more money in the long run because I have no investment in that good to resell it. And that's where, where this ownership thing becomes a self-generating neg negative uh, retroaction, if you will, of the concept of property. It's uh, extremely primitive, frankly, and environmentally unethical, especially primitive given the advanced technology we have today to assist in an access society in a way that was unconceivable before. Point four, growth. The market economy not only needs consumption in general, it actually requires growth, and often increasing rates of growth. This is always, of course, the conversation of governments. You know, how often do you turn on the news? And we need more growth, they say. Well, what does the natural world think about infinite growth in society? Obviously, as implied before, the Earth is a balanced system. It demands a, demands a balanced, load economy, respecting dynamic equilibrium. Anything else is really quite incompatible in the long run. Uh, we need a steady state economy. That is the term, a steady state economy, which in fact could only be the nature, again, of a truly economic social practice on that level. Point five, competition. This gets into the development of scientific and human study uh, ex explicitly, because competition has been a mythological issue for a long time based on very primitive instincts that go back to periods of heavy scarcity. The market economy's operational incentive premise is competition through the pursuit of self-interest. It is based, as noted, upon personal and corporate competition in the open market. However, emerging sociological and psychological studies now show long-term distortion with the competitive field. Please see researchers such as Daniel Pink or Alfie Cohen for more details on this issue. Not to mention, needless to say, frankly, competition is at the core of an enormous number of justified atrocities and inhumanity across the world. Overall, it simply isn't necessary for human progress, as this traditional theory pretends that we simply can't operate in a collaborative way on the level of basic human organization. It causes far more problems today than it does progressive innovation, that's, that's for sure. People use the incentive innovation excuse for competition all the time. And it's been found, in fact, that that isn't the case. Creative processes actually are inhibited by the competitive mentality. This is a huge subject to examine, not the scope of what I want to do today, but collaboration and the sharing of ideas, not the hiding of them through corporate proprietary claims, could catapult progress on this planet to an extent never before seen if we chose to begin to work together on that level. Imagine if all the cell phone companies got together rather than competing with each other and decided to take their same ideas and unify themselves to create the absolute best based on a scientific referent of what's actually possible. Imagine the efficiency that would be created. Imagine the loss of the intrinsic obsolescence that I just denoted prior as well, and how much more sustainable that word again things would be. Point six, labor for income. As we know, we work in a system where your right to life, as it were, is based upon earning income through labor in some way. That could be considered, in fact, a core driver of everything, of the basis of the system, since we started economics as far as the custom is concerned. For many millennia, it has been inconceivable that the human mind will give birth to such a massive paradigm time, paradigm shifting invention that we have today, a phenomenon called mechanization, which is the automation of human labor. 
The advent of automation is now making human employment more scarce at a minimum and definitely obsolete in many sectors. It is also more productive and efficient than human labor and safer, which means from a truly humane economic standpoint, it is literally irresponsible for us not to apply this technique in all areas we can, which is applicable again in virtually all sectors now. You know, I'm sure we've all used an electric drill. If you had the choice to use a hand drill or an electric drill, what would you choose? I will also add that the unemployment crisis in this world, unannounced to most, is driven entirely by technology replacing human labor. Now, you have to look at the broad scheme. Really, the entire displacement, the entire movement of all of our sectors through time and human history has been based on the incorporation of technology. So, point seven, scarcity and imbalance. Money moves due to imbalance, scarcity, and inefficiency. Players in the market economy can maintain no advantage if there is any kind of equilibrium in society. Deprivation and needs outstanding are a positive factor in the market economy and the enormous class divide and poverty you see as a result, this is built in. It's not gonna be resolved through governmental regulation policy and new organizations. If there was balance and needs being met in society, the market system would fail. Sorry, that sounds dramatic, but if you really think about it, it's actually true. Needless to say, our public health is dependent on a number of factors and the natural laws governing human systems requires that our needs be met, or we will develop sickness, disease, neuroses, and various negative propensities. The natural law economy, as noted on the right side of this slide, recognizes that shared universal human needs, we have to make this first priority. Shared universal human needs are first priority for any society organizing itself with the intention to actually take care of its population. Otherwise, we all continue to suffer. Also, it has been found that on the social level, equality is much more positive for public health psychologically than stratification. This goes back in context to competition in a certain way as well. Our stratified society is a foundational cause of a vast spectrum of problems. And the more stratified a given society, the more unhealthy and violent that society is. The United States is a perfect example. We have one of the most stratified uh, countries in the world and we also have one of the most outrageous violence rates, crime rates, mental disorder rates, and other issues that can be causally linked to this psychological, sociological phenomenon. Uh, I really recommend the work of Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett on this issue. So, putting all of this together, what we have today is what I call the spectrum of social disorder. The consequences are all the basic issues we hear about in the public media today. Debt collapse, pollution, disorders, resource depletion, increasing cancer rates, poverty, unemployment, growing wealth gaps. Uh, this relationship of our macroeconomic model to the species is extremely detrimental and unhealthy, and by definition, extremely unsustainable in the long term. And there's many other things I could say on the subject but for the course of time, I want to conclude and leave you with one final point. We often hear this word corruption. On a daily basis, this word is not presented to us. What is corruption? When the hard drive on your computer corrupts, what's happening? Something's out of sync with the governing hardware that's installed or software, whatever. Likewise, in society, when a person goes and robs a bank, they are violating governing legal systems and of this social model, and therefore they are deemed corrupt by that association. If there is any point, again, I would like to leave you, it is the consideration that maybe the entire social system from top to bottom that we employ is actually existing as an inherent corruption in and of itself of the true emerging governing natural law system of the earth that I have been referencing in this presentation as a natural law economy. And if that is true, 
which I hope has been made clear on some level in the prior examples. We are faced with a very radical imperative in conclusion, and that is that true societal improvement can only come from a total system redesign to a new model that actually respects and adapts the true governing principles of the natural world. And that is the big picture. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm Peter Jensen. Thank you very much, um, Peter, for that very much uh, presentation. Um, Melanie, if you want to switch on your um, video as well. And what we'll do is we'll switch over to the discussion view which allows us to look at all the chat that's coming through and for us to answer any questions uh, around that. Um, so let's just expand this out a bit. And see if everybody can see that. Okay. Okay. Should be expensive a bit. Great. Okay. Right. So uh, this is the time for people to um, post any questions that they have towards Melanie. Uh, or towards Peter, and um, I'll let Melanie and Peter, between them, uh, answer the questions as they come in, and uh, if I see any that they have not uh, looked at yet, then I'll point that out to them. Um, but perhaps I should begin by asking both Melanie and um, Peter, <laughs> if people were to wake up tomorrow morning, um, what are the two questions that they should ask themselves in terms of, one, um, what they should be trying to change their thinking on, and two, um, what they should perhaps be um, trying to change uh, in terms of the way that they're actually acting. So how should they think differently each morning, um, and you know, how should they perhaps act differently each morning? Um, do you have a couple of questions that people might find really critical to explore uh, every morning that they wake up, given the things that you're describing are going on in the world? But I think I understood your question. Uh, as far as what people need to begin to think about as far as I'm concerned,